Good evening and welcome to this Tuesday, August 15th, 2017 meeting of the Raymore Planning and Zoning Commission. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I need to steal a pen. <coughs> you have a spare pen. Oh, sure. Okay, thank you. In good shape. Let me remind you, please make sure your microphone is on and speak into the mic for the record. And we'll call roll. Commissioner Anderson. Present. Commissioner Armstrong. Present. Commissioner Bowie. Present. Commissioner Crane. Present. Commissioner Pfizer. Present. Commissioner Meiske. Present. Commissioner Sarsfield. Present. Mayor Turnbow. Here. And Commissioner Faulkner is present. We have a quorum. In fact, we have the whole commission. Uh, there are no personal appearances scheduled this evening. One item on the consent agenda, acceptance of minutes of the August 1st, 2017 meeting. And unless any of the commissioners have concerns, I would entertain a motion either to accept consent agenda or accept minutes from the August 1st, 2017 meeting. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. I'll second it. And a second by Commissioner Pfizer. All those in favor, raise a hand, please. Let's see, I'm going to have to tab here, so Bowie, Armstrong, Anderson, uh, Pfizer, and Sarsfield, and any opposed, and all those abstaining, uh, let's see, Abstain. I've lost somebody. Mr. Crane is reading his oh. list of over Are you abstaining? No, I voted. Oh, you voted for, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Abstaining were members who were not present at the last meeting. So I'll count that as six in favor, none opposed, and three abstentions. Commissioners Faulkner, Meiske, and Mayor Turnbow. Okay. Uh, moving ahead, under old business this evening, our first case, 17024, g, &G Storage Site Plan. And Mr. Cataret and Mr. Grass, if you'd like to start the case with staff report, we would appreciate that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, before I begin, I will say for a, the third time, uh, we will be unable to uh, broadcast any materials to your, all, uh, to your all computers this evening. We are still experiencing um, some difficulties getting that program up and running. Um, but later in the presentation, I will have a couple images up on the projector um, if you'd like to see a little bit larger images that are included in your staff report packets. Uh, moving ahead, as you mentioned, the first case, uh, old business for this evening is the G&G &G storage uh, site plan approval. Uh, the applicant, uh, Todd Glidewell, is here uh, seeking approval for a self-storage facility here in the city of Raymore. Um, at our last meeting on August 1st, uh, we had a shortage of commission members. Uh, we had five present, and with that, it would have required five uh, commission members voting in favor of that site plan to approve it. Uh, therefore, we thought it would be best to table that discussion until this meeting when we could have a, a full commission uh, that could participate in the discussion. Um, before I jump too far ahead into the staff report, I just wanted to make sure that um, you guys are okay with me going through the staff report for a second time. I know we had a couple commission members absent last time. Um, so if you'd like me to go through the entire staff report, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, but if you guys would like me to save some time, we can skip ahead to the discussion. Um, I'll wait for, uh, for you all to advise. I think I'd be fine with an abridged staff report, maybe just a quick summary. Do any of the commissioners want a full reading of the staff report? No. Sounds like we're good. Go ahead, Mr. Grass. Thank you. Uh, so as I mentioned, the, the applicant, g, &G uh, Storage LLC, is seeking site plan approval for a self-storage facility located um, on 58 Highway, just west or just east of the Ramblewood subdivision and west of the Falcon Crest subdivision. 
Um, I've included a number of photographs in the staff report for you to consider. Uh, if you can get a feel of kind of what the site looks like currently, um, as far as the existing natural features, some vegetation, um, and, uh, you know, the entrance off of 50, it's sort of what that looks like. Um, the existing zoning is M1 Light Industrial District, so the use of a self-storage facility is an allowable use, um, and it's surrounded by undeveloped single-family residential to the north, single-family residential to the south, uh, multi-family residential to the east, and single-family residential and commercial to the west. Uh, moving ahead, like I said, to previous actions on the property. Um, on June 6th of 2017, the Raymore Board of Adjustment granted a variance to the side yard setback for this property. Um, the typical setback for an M1 uh, industrial district is 10 feet. Um, however, because this property does abut two residential districts, that increases it to 20 feet. Um, the applicant um, requested a, a reduction of that by 10 feet, and the Board of Adjustment approved that at its June 6, 2017 meeting. Um, a couple comments related to the site. Uh, the applicant does own the American Self Storage Facility that exists on Evans Avenue here in Raymore, um, and has indicated that there is a waiting list for available units at that facility. Uh, we've included the development standards that, that exist for an M1 zone property here in the city of Raymore. Um, the applicant has indicated that on the site plan they will uh, locate the front row of the storage units about 15 feet um, from the front property line, which they are allowed to do per section 410.030C of the Unified Development Code. Um, the, for landscaping, the type A screening will be required along the entire east side of the property as well as portions of the north property line uh, and roughly 405 feet along the west property line and I've included sort of a, a picture of what that'll look like as far as the screening and I have an example of that that I'll pass around to you all as well this evening uh, for you to get a look at. As far as pedestrian access, sidewalks are provided to connect to the existing pedestrian sidewalk uh, network along 58 Highway. Uh, signage was not submitted as part of the site plan because it is not as approved as a part of the site plan. However, the, uh, the location and the design of the proposed uh, signage on the property is in compliance with the Unified Development Code. Uh, the fire district did review this plan and had uh, one comment regarding the distance between the existing hydrants and the proposed building. Um, because the distance was greater than 300 feet, the fire district was requiring that they install four new hydrants uh, to be in compliance with that 300 foot rule. Uh, Stormwater on the site will be collected on site and treated via detention pond at the northern, prop or northern portion of the property and will be conveyed and uh, discharged into an existing creek that runs along the north property line. Um, site, access will, site access will be provided mainly off of Walnut Street. However, there will be an additional site or site entrance off of Ramblewood and the applicant has requested that that be um, accessible for residents or for visitors and uh, customers of this site as an exit only. Um, and it will be accessible for fire purposes as well. Uh, staff did submit proposed findings of fact for your consideration this evening. Um, and as I mentioned before at our last meeting, there was a five to zero vote to table this discussion until this evening so we could have a more in-depth uh, discussion regarding the site plan. Um, if you have any, any additional questions, I'm more than happy to answer and the applicant is here as well in the audience um, if you have any questions for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Grass. Um, would it be appropriate to bring the applicant up to the podium now? And so if you would, uh, we'll let you add to uh, what staff has said about the case. Sure. In order to, oh, you. There we go. In order to uh, save your neck from bending, I have Mr. Catterat handing out a few slides that okay. I'll show you while we are uh, experiencing and, technical and difficulties. And if I remember right, Matt? Yeah, correct. Matt Slish, Engineering Solutions. Thank you. 50 Southeast 30th Street, Lisa, Missouri. Thanks. And with with me is uh, Ty Glideway with uh, Thank uh, you. G and G as well. It's always good to have that for the record. Sure. Thank Thanks. you. All right. So we appreciate the time to come back. I know that we were tabled a couple weeks ago, so we thought maybe we'd kind of run through some of the comments we heard um, that night, and maybe some of the presentation. Just kind of explain what this project is. Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Glywell owns a self-storage facility that is to the east of this property that has been experiencing great demand over the last number of years. And so what he's been looking for for quite some time is an opportunity to develop more of those self-storage units, varying sizes, which is why we went and did that side yard setback reduction with the BZA. So 
what that side yard setback reduction allowed us to do is vary some of the internal uh, storage building sizes in their depths to allow for greater opportunity for the renters. In addition, what he's allowing or providing here is a unique opportunity in the storage world to where the front storage units would be a larger bay. The larger bay could house the RVs, it could house your boats, but it also has the opportunity to house your smaller contractors. So your guy that's starting out, your guy that's working out of his home, your guy that's a gutter, carpet guy, handyman. So to get these trucks, to get these trailers, to get these things that are currently sitting in driveways or at houses, you know, in subdivisions, it gives them an opportunity to have a garage or a bay, to basically have the office warehouse without having to expend the money to build the entire office warehouse by itself. So it's kind of a unique opportunity, and so that's kind of what we've done is on the south side of the site, the larger buildings that will be there are 24-hour access, not gated, but basically, you know, a contractor could come in, there will be the opportunity to have a small office, a little bathroom in there so that if he had clients, they could come there. So it will function almost in a sense like it's a office warehouse, but it allows multiple tenants. So it's kind of like the shared office concept that people are doing on the um, more office concepts, but it's with a contractor. In the back side, it's a standard rental facility, gated um, basically on the south side and then gated on the west side. Now the west side access point is something I want to talk about in, the, in a little bit, but that's the, the point that directly connects to Ramblewood to the existing road right away. So if you look at um, the second sheet, it kind of shows the site plan. It's a little blurry on the, I understand on that eight and a half by 11, but essentially, um, like we'd said, to the north is kind of the regular storage units, to the far north is the detention facility, and to the south is kind of those larger storage units that could be used for boats, RVs, or kind of that office contractor. Now, in the last meeting, you guys had had some conversations about what does a rental unit or a mini storage provide to Raymore. And so I did some work and trying to talk to the Cass County Assessor just to kind of get an idea of, just for general ideas of what would the tax assessment be on this property. So the idea of what would it come to you as a Raymore overall in your tax number. So, so what you can see in there is if I just compare Ramblewood, which is the P mix or your residential subdivision to the west, essentially they're gonna generate somewhere in the neighborhood of $9,500 per acre. This commercial use is how they're gonna assess it in a Cass County is gonna generate somewhere in the neighborhood of $12,200 per acre. So it's a 25 to 30% increase in taxable value but the other benefit to it is this mini storage is going to utilize very minimal resources. There is a few bathrooms in those larger buildings, but nothing in the back, so the sanitary sewer and the water demand is gonna be way down. Traffic on something like this where a normal commercial application could generate you know, 50, 100 cars during peak hours is gonna generate 25 trips in a day. You know, so from a, a true use on demand or a true use on city services, a mini storage is very accommodating but still generates the same value and the same cost because the tax assessor assesses basically based on square footage of building and constructible cost. So it was just kind of a comment that had happened in that last meeting about what, what this provides as far as this versus some other type of commercial use. Now if you look at the third page, it starts talking about the egress plan. And this is one thing where we're, we're gonna ask to vary from staff's recommendation. <clears throat> on the west side of the site, when Ramblewood was developed, there was an access road, a public right-of-way that was connected directly to this site. And I want to note that when this development was done, or when Ramblewood was done, when Falcon Crest to the east was done, this site has always been disowned light industrial. So the idea, in my mind at least, is with that public road that's accessing this property, they were well aware at that time what potentially could have gone in here. You know, they were well aware that their residential street was going to connect to the east into what was zoned a light industrial facility. While this could have been something much more intensive of a use, which like I said on this sheet what I've done is I've shown kind of what um, a trip generation uh, study would show is that if a light industrial uh, building or facility was built here, because of the size, on a weekday it would generate 347 trips on a day. 
on the weekends it would generate somewhere in the neighborhood of 58 trips per day. Whereas based on Mr. Glidewell's existing facility to the east, this facility is expected to generate 15 trips in a day and 25 trips on the weekend. So when Ramblewood was connected to it, the opportunity was there that a much larger number of traffic volume could have gone through that street and would have been allowed. And so staff's recommendation currently is that that connection on the west side be a limited connection only for fire access. And what we're asking for is it to be limited on a certain point, but to be limited so we can egress from the site, exit out of the site, we do not want to enter, but also we're willing to limit the hours of operation of it so that we don't have people having 24 hour access to get out of there. So maybe during the hours of eight to eight at night or eight to nine at night or something like that, someone in that northern part of that facility would have the opportunity to get out through Ramblewood and get back out to the site as opposed to driving all the way south because the idea would be is that if there's a couple of people moving in, there's big trucks trying to maneuver through that facility, gets a little difficult. So giving them an opportunity just to have egress through that site um, is what we'd like to request as opposed to what staff currently has suggested that that be a limited access to fire only and we couldn't use it for egress. So we have no intent on using ingress. We would remove any ability to have a gate system on our side or on Ramblewood side in order to get into that facility, but at least so that we could get out. The other reason that gate is, is useful is just like any operating uh, mechanical part out there, we have had instances in the current storage facility where the gate breaks. You have a problem with the gate, a belt breaks, and so the current system is that Todd will get a call and Todd will have to show up and the you know, the customer could be sitting there for a couple hours. And so he has registered a few complaints from customers saying, man, we really wish on your existing site there was a way to get in and out in those situations. And so that's kind of another reason for this facility. While it's more limited in nature, we hope, because we hope the system continues to work fine at the gates, we would like it as a secondary option for people to get out should something happen to one of the gates for that facility. The next sheet would be a, uh, a case that actually you guys are going to hear here in a little bit. I think it just represents well because um, I think some conversations were had about, um, I think the zoning was called a, uh, a kaleidoscope of zoning areas is what I think the word was used. And so, mm -hmm. so I wanted to kind of show and demonstrate, um, you know, this Heritage Hills project is coming up before you, I think, this evening. And to the north side of our property is where that development is. That's the area where they have all of their green open space for their detention for all of their existing trees to remain or whatever they're gonna do up in that area. But the point being, I guess, is there's a significant buffer between their project and our project. To the east and to the west, where Ramblewood is and Falcon Crest to the east, you know, it's, it's the same conversation we had at the BZA meeting where, in our opinion, our site has been zoned light industrial since the 70s, well before Ramblewood was done, well before Falcon Crest was done. All of those people were aware and had the ideas of what was going in here or what could go in here. You know, so, so from our standpoint, I guess, is that on the west side by Ramblewood, you know, we're going to use a very dense, heavy screening. The back of the building walls will serve as a very nice barrier protection. And again, on the same thing on the east, there'll be a nice landscaped area and a nice buffer between those two properties. So from our standpoint of where this site sits, it's actually pretty ideally located for this type of a development. So if you go past then on your sheets, I have a picture of your guys' zoning map. And again, this is just to kind of go into the discussion of, of how and why we believe, because I think that during the last meeting, the idea of industrial creep was used and, and the idea of what could happen or what should happen and what needed to be out there. And, and the idea of even looking at your zoning map, you know, on the east side of town, as you come in the industrial kind of area, there's a large area of development that is to be done. And in between what is Falcon Crest and, and the kind of the, the industrial area to the east right now, the assumption is that that's probably going to be some type of a commercial or industrial development in that area for the simple fact that, again, it's pinned on the east by industrial, it's pinned on the west by multifamily development. So, so the idea, I think, is, is that this project, while isolated in its current location with industrial, with the P-mix on the west, some commercial kind of to the south and west, and then the multifamily to the east, I would contend more that Falcon Crest was probably the 
outlier as far as zoning requirements would go or zoning development would go in this situation. Probably that industrial or commercial development is going to continue to the west, um, kind of up to where that commercial area is now. Uh, if you continue on, then what I've tried to provide to you is some uh, building pictures. So this is the American storage facility that's there. This is, is very similar to what you're going to see out there as far as the architectural uh, metal panel. Um, basically, it's that metal panel with a baked on kind of stucco finish. Um, the difference between this picture and what you'll see in ours is obviously we've provided a type A screening between our development and these building facades. So in that 10 foot area, I'll show it in a little bit where the landscape plan is. There's a large number of trees, shrubs, bushes to kind of break up that facade, but also give a very nice definish, definition of, of division between the residential areas and the, um, oh yeah, there's your panel, so you can see it as well. Yeah. And, and I think it should be noted, um, you know, during the BZA process when we had that, um, the owner of Falcon Crest was there expressed some concerns. The majority of his concerns was, were related to stormwater management and how we were going to you know, control the stormwater. We discussed that with him and I think we left the meeting in a very good understanding and an agreement of where we were. The developer to the west or the owner to the Ramblewood subdivision wasn't able to come to that BZA meeting but I think did, did express some concern um, to the setback and the reduction of the area but ultimately I think lended himself to understand that it was there when he bought his property, so he kind of went all along with that, that piece of it. So, so like I say, as you kind of continue on for the next couple pictures, there's a couple building pictures. Um, as you continue on, then we took some pictures of some very nice trees and shrubs and bushes and stuff that is there. So along the east, the west, and the north side of our site right now is a very dense um, vegetated area. And essentially, we've agreed that as much of that as can stay is going to stay. And where it doesn't stay, we're going to put new plants in to basically create that blocker um, and get that area out. And so th there's a couple pictures in there, and there's one that you'll see that kind of shows the red end of road kind of diamonds. That's the end of Ramblewood Drive right now. You know, so so I, I just I put it in there basically for the representation of if you look at it and see as it sits there. In our opinion, it, it was obvious and evident that that road was to continue through that that road should be used as an access and we feel like we've gone you know, to a very uh, compromising state to say that basically we're, we're willing to limit our, our facility to ex exit only. You know, we don't anticipate and don't intend that to be used that often, but just, just to have that opportunity to have a secondary access is our purpose for there. So as you continue on through the site pictures, like I say, there's just more pictures kind of of the site, the existing vegetation that's there. Um, and then the last one is just the landscape plan. Again, I apologize for the eight and a half by 11 size, but as you can see, basically, there's a tree planted every 30 or 40 feet along the east and the west barrier. Um, up in the front or the southern portion where the buildings are not present or anywhere where there's not a building present, we've also planted some evergreens um, and some lower lying plants to try to blockade that, that lower system of the deciduous trees, so that way there would be a good barrier between the two. And then also I commented on there, um, because it was commented about the last meeting about the, the growth of those trees. So, that, so the tree itself that we plant is a two, two and a half inch caliper tree, which is typically in that four to six foot range. The purpose is, is that landscapers have identified that that's the tree that will survive best in, in any environment. So planting a larger tree in these areas have a higher probability of dying. This two and a half, two and a half, two to two and a half inch diameter tree has the best probability of living, but the trees that we've selected all have a growth rate of 12 to 24 inches per year. So if they go in and they're four to six feet tall, the buildings are eight feet tall. So within you know a year or two, the tree is already going to go above and beyond the building itself there and be providing additional screening. So I believe that's everything I saw and remember from the last meeting. So I will stand for questions. Thank you. Questions for Mr. See if I can get this right. Slish. Slish, you nailed it. <laughs> no, I always want to put a hard T oh, on yeah, the end of it. But <laughs> questions for the architect, Commissioner Meiske. I, I have one question. Um, using Ramblewood Drive as an egress, um, can you get a 26 foot U haul? throughout the facility without using that as an egress? Uh, yes, so 
internally in our site, we've run a 49 foot truck template through the entire area for okay. South Metro so they could see that their fire truck could maneuver around through there. Okay. The reason of having that access point again is that, you know, like I say, if, if someone's in kind of that middle section of the site, mm -hmm. kind of in between the two access points, and what might happen on a Saturday or like even a weekday, you know, everybody's going to show up at that six to eight o'clock range at night. If somebody gets a truck in the middle one and then a truck in a far one, it just gets to be kind of a precarious situation. So that, that's the only reason for that exit is to allow someone who's more of a novice driving that truck a way to get themselves back out without having to weave their way through all of those buildings to get out. Okay. And like I say, expectations would be, like I say, you know, if you're a guy that has a one of the units kind of in the middle or towards the southern half, you're always going to use that that southern gate. The only person that would probably use that gate there in the middle would be a guy that, like I say, is on that north end or kind of further end that he'd have to work his way all the way through the facility. Okay, so my concern is driving through a residential housing addition with kids playing, kids on bikes and everything, and you have a novice driving a big truck. Right, but I mean, I, I oh. guess I guess it'd be the same point, though. I mean, you have you know, I mean, in that subdivision itself there, I think you have 58 homes. So, I mean, it's the same opportunities of people driving that truck whenever they're moving in and out of their own house. Not as many, though, because you're going to have a lot of traffic going into a storage unit as opposed to people moving in and out of houses. Right. I, I guess, though, again, like I say, the, the anticipated daily traffic on a weekday is five trucks or five cars, as it isn't always going to be a moving truck. You know, on a weekend, I mean, maybe you're talking 15 to 20, and you're talking maybe some small percentage of them even say, you know, half of it. You know, you're talking maybe 10 people come out and they're not all driving, you know, we're talking about the big trucks, but I mean, they're all, you know, when you go to a mini storage, they're not all driving that big U-Haul truck right. every time they're there. I mean, mm -hmm. I understand your concern. I guess my point would be, I, I think it's very limited on the truck that you'd have driving down that road to get out of that facility. Plus, like I say, it's, it's a public roadway. So in the same sense, if it's not that guy in that U-Haul driving down that street, that street could have been filled up with you know, that could have become a commercial development area where you would have had, you know, 300 cars coming in and out of that facility all day long. That could have been anything from a truck to a car to anything else. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Commissioner Bowie. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, I have some, I have some other things I want to talk about, but I think that's one, we'll save that for our discussion. But you mentioned a couple things. I think I heard somebody say f new hydrants. Did I hear that from someone? Four right. new hydrants? Yes, correct. Um, okay. And uh, the, the bill on those would go to who? who? Who's paying for that? The developer would okay. install those. Okay. The other thing you said was larger units to the south. Is that right? Right. So, so those larger units would be visible from 58 Highway. And the larger units is where, is where um, some of the larger SUVs and some of those type of things are usually parked or stored? So the larger units to the south, so we'll back up, and I didn't really express this to you, the, the development to the south is these bigger buildings that would have the opportunity to house an RV, a boat, or your guy that's your contractor that owns a truck and a trailer or whatever it might be, a guttering guy. What we also have agreed to do is on that south side that would be right along 58 Highway mm -hmm. is to not allow that to be a mini storage or architectural metal panel. It would actually have to gain some architectural elements to appear as though as a commercial frontage, you know, so there would be things on that front, whether it be a faux window or some breaks or, you know, some, some kind of um, architectural, architectural stuff basically to the front of it that I don't think we've come up with the exact design of, but to break it up so that that bigger building is not just the big architectural metal panel sitting on that on 58 highway, I think is what it sounds like your concern is. Mm -hmm. There'll be some architectural elements added to that 58 side to make it look more commercial in nature versus just a metal building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I've got a question for you. Uh, so I'm assuming that this is an unmanned facility. There's not someone in an office on site. Is that correct? Currently, Todd's plan is to try to use the office manager that's at the American Storage, which is just to the east. Yeah. And if that becomes have a, not possible. Have a sign or something right. at the gate that directs. Right. Well, most of the gates are automated anyway, so it's either a keypad or a passcode. Well, and that, that's really where I was going with the question. So, so part way, part way back into this, uh, somewhere along 
the larger units or where the larger units transition to smaller, there will be an unmanned gate, uh, an operated gate. Correct. Would the, uh, would the proposal for the exit only onto Ramblewood Drive also be automated in some fashion so that it wouldn't necessarily allow traffic to key in but would allow uh, some way of opening that gate to exit, I guess? Right, so our, our plan would be is that if we can get that as an exit only, mm -hmm. there would be no keypad on the Ramblewood side so they right. could not access. On the inside the facility storage, so you'd have the ability to use your keypad to get out, Okay. but we could then program it such that the hours could be limited, uh, you know, so uh, that during certain hours we wouldn't go into the residential right. subdivision to, so to limit So signage or whatever. Right, and, okay. and that's what Todd could do with basically his contracts is set up the time frames allowable to use that access versus yeah. the other. Okay, thank you. That clarifies. Uh, other questions from Commission? Which Commissioner Meisky. Which leads me to a question. How does the fire department gain access? So the fire department would always have emergency access through either a Knox box system or an emergency code that they could get themselves in and out of that facility at any time. So on the, both entrances? On both entrances, okay. yeah. Yeah, the fire will always have 24-hour access, but okay. we can limit our users to limited access to when we want. Okay. Yep, Commissioner Anderson. Just for, I guess, information for the commissioners and Mr. Mayor, who was not here at the last meeting, you know, why we tabled a discussion to, to this particular meeting here. And uh, me personally, I had a concern, and I think this is consistent with uh, the next applicant on the agenda regarding a lot of the zone creep that we have within this particular area here. Um, I will say with reflection, it's nothing against the applicant. I think uh, we did not do, do our due diligence in terms of the planning and zoning uh, within this particular area. Uh, if you look at the zoning map, we have, what, seven or eight different zoning within this area here. And that's something that we probably dropped the ball on. So, Mr. Zer? Okay. No, that's so, all right. So I just want to make it clear that, you know, it was nothing against the applicant. It was just more so that what we did as, as a commission or maybe as a city that, you know, it's a lost opportunity here. Okay. Now your turn, Mr. Zer. Would you, would you care to? <laughs> Chairman, I, I would not have. Would you care to put everything <clears throat> into, into legal perspective for us, please? I, I apologize if my hand gesture interrupted uh, Commissioner Anderson. I would not have, I would not have interrupted otherwise. <laughs> um, real quickly, and, and I will implore the commission to ask a couple more questions with regard to the applicant as well too. But I, I had the opportunity, I was not here at the last uh, PNZ meeting and had the opportunity to go back and review the um, minutes from the same that were approved this evening. Um, there was some discussion with regard to the zoning and I want to make sure and impress upon the commission this evening that uh, we really are not here for evaluation and discussion with regard to the use of this property. The use of this property has been set, it is in place, it has been set since the 70s. Uh, so anything that's developed around the outside of it uh, is coming to the location with subject knowledge of what this pro property could potentially be utilized for. Um, besides that notion, we do have a GMP out there. This particular property had just never been addressed by the GMP and the overall, this is what we anticipate happening in the area. This applicant has found this particular property. Uh, it complies with his proposed use under the current zoning application. So I would dissuade the commission from considering the use in general of this property for their decision tonight. Uh, I would note for them that the uh, traffic discussion as well as the trip generation that uh, Mr. Schlisch was able to provide this evening is excellent uh, uh, information for your consideration. Uh, the assessment and tax benefits of it are not necessarily the purview of the Planning and Zoning Commission either at the end of the day, though understanding a little bit about what the property is going to be operating and doing is helpful for you. Um, the two things I would suggest that you make sure and reference back to, and the staff has always done very good about this, and if you recall our training in the past, our trust the code analysis, uh, you'll see references in the, uh, uh, with regard to site plan review under 470.160, and that's included within your staff report as well, for the six things that are of consideration for site plan review, and again, more importantly, the findings of fact that you'll find under sub E for that, and staff, of course, has inserted some of the uh, information within those, and that would list it off A through K. Um, 
I would refer you to each of those two locations for purposes of making your determination this evening as opposed to the this is the overlying use or there's a kaleidoscope of zoning information within this area. Uh, the only thing I would uh, suggest be questioned from the applicant at this time and I will leave it to the commission is uh, whether or not all the other conditions that staff has identified with the exception of the west side access are acceptable to the applicant in this particular case uh, and then it will be up to the commission and I'm not going to insert myself into that one uh, with regard to whether or not this site plan does in fact comply with the findings of fact that are outlined under code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Zer. Um, so I guess before we move on and I forget the question, I think <laughs> Mr. Zer's point was well taken. I'm assuming that all of the other conditions were acceptable to the applicant since you only raised the one concern, but would you confirm that for the commission? Correct. Yeah, we're, we're fine with every recommendation with the exception of we just want to have a slight variation to the one on the exit. Yeah, understand. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Zer. Well, I missed the meeting two weeks ago, but I did give this a very thorough read and a, and a drive by. And um, Actually, I'll go on record as being comfortable with using Ramblewood as exit only. I, I don't feel that's unreasonable. Uh, should the rest of the commission agree, Mr. Zur, I'm sure we could work that into a motion. And I think commission would have some options in terms of granting the use of the Ramblewood exit on a perhaps uh, I'm trying to think, a time limit basis or something like that. Is that correct or not? Uh, Chairman, I would probably suggest to you that under your conditions of approval for site plan, the uh, language that is provided is in approving a site plan, the Planning and Zoning Commission, or when applicable, the Community Development Director may impose reasonable conditions, safeguards, and restrictions upon the applicant and the premises. And I would suggest to you that the access point for exit, I'm sorry, the exit point or egress point at that location, uh, including reasonable times for the same, would be an acceptable condition for consideration by the commission this evening. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Chair. If I could. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jonathan, with regard to that Ramblewood exit, is there a potential for, uh, because I know that the, the plan for the south end is for the larger vehicles, with the potential for that Ramblewood exit, is there a, a way to and maybe Jim, this is a good question for you to uh, minimize the size. In other words, put a, a seven and a half foot limit, a bar above that egress so that a larger vehicle cannot exit that point. Or is that something that would interfere with what the fire department would consider mm. a safety issue? Mr. Crass, you want to answer that? Yeah, Mr. Crass, please. Um, and I'm glad the mayor brought that up because it, given the opportunity, I was going to suggest something to the commission for their consideration if they want to open that <coughs> exit up to vehicles. We, we actually have a, a model for what the, uh, what the mayor is, is asking about and I believe the planning commission and the council have recently adopted that and it was the definition of vehicles that we used when we adopted an ordinance that allows the council to designate construction routes mm. for subdivisions. There is some very specific language in there regarding the types of types of vehicles. Uh, the uh, use to the south is, is um, I believe, contemplates those type of vehicles. It's the pickup truck with a bobcat on a trailer. It's the dump truck with a with a trailer. It specifically isn't the transient type vehicles, which is the U-Hauls or delivery vehicles and and those type of things. And I, I, I think that would be an appropriate restriction for uh, planning commission to consider is those type of vehicles be inserted into this, not so much the height, but the weight um, to, to address that. It, because I think what the, what the complaints are gonna be, I don't, I think it's, first of all, the trip generation numbers that, that they've been presented, those are similar to single family home trip generation numbers. So it, it's not an excessive amount of traffic that's gonna be coming out of there. I, I think it is reasonable to expect the U-Hauls and those type of things, because those are similar to a UPS truck and, and such. I think the concern becomes either 
uh, from the noise or the perception of speed when you have trucks hauling trailers bouncing around through a residential neighborhood on a re regular basis can be be a concern. So I think it's it's reasonable if the if the applicant agrees to let's let's restrict those to the to the nor to the southern act uh, southern access. It doesn't we don't want to you know not allow them through the gate to the other because they may have materials and other things stored in the uh, northern units, but at least restrict those to egress and ing ingress and egress to 58 Highway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kras. I guess the way I'm looking at it is sort of path of least resistance. Uh, just thinking that vehicles on the south will come out to 58 Highway because that's the shortest path. Mr. Zur. Yes, I apologize. While uh, Mr. Kras was speaking at that particular point, the uh, applicant's representative actually came up to me. I think it would be good to have input from him with regard to the access points for potential construction vehicles through that location and potentially limiting the height provisions with regard to that as well, too. So okay. if I might recommend to the no, that's chair. Fine. That we, uh, we love running applicants back and forth to the podium, as Mr. Slish well knows. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, the only comment I was going to make is that anything, and it, it's well understood on the south end of, of your construction traffic wanting to get back out to 58, but I guess the only point I would make is that any units in that larger on that south side that would be the construction guys, those trailers, won't access, can't get into access into that back area. So they will have, they won't have the ability to go into the site to exit Ramblewood. And we're fine with limiting whatever travel we'd have to get through there onto Ramblewood. Our only concern would be is obviously we've got to be able to get that U-Haul truck out of there. So I don't know what a, you know, if we have to have a height of a truck, it would be whatever the big mom's attic U-Haul truck is, which is probably under 12 feet. Right. But, but there won't be any construction, you know, like you were talking about a truck with a trailer with a bobcat, that'll be everything that'll be restricted to 58 highway. So it sounds like you have some language in your right. code you could use for that, we'd be fine well, with. Well, the key, the key benefit to me is not a lot different than the fire entrance. Uh, frankly, it's it's a what if, but you know I can I can picture. I've I've not been in the uh, American storage, but I've I've been in other storage units. And you know, as uh, Commissioner Anderson said, yeah, I'm the driver you worry about because I'm not used to pulling a trailer and and right. I'm certainly not good at backing up but if I get in there and somebody's blocking another aisle and I'm stuck then I either wait or you know I think uh, for the few uses that I see the Ramblewood exit actually having I think it would be a good option right and and certainly would provide some relief uh, from getting blocked in there and not being able to get out for a period of time. And right. the comment about the broken gate also. And in our opinion too, like I say, if you, if you look at it just from a user, an end user's perspective, it would be very unlikely that anyone would choose to go out that exit unless something like that situation right. has occurred. Because like I say, it's out Ramblewood to make a turn to come back out to 58 Highway. So it would probably double your trip time as far as drive length. So, right. so more than likely, unless there's some kind of a circumstance that would direct them or force them to go that way. My opinion is all or most are going to use that pitch highway access point. No, I, I tend to agree with you. I think most people will come out the way they came in unless there's a problem. But, uh, you know, the comment about the belt on the gate drive breaking, yeah, we know that happens. Right. And having only one way in and out, uh, it's not good for the fire department. It's really not that good for the customer either. Right. So yep, appreciate, appreciate it. That. Other commissioners, questions, comments? Mr. Chair. Commissioner Anderson. Just, just to make certain that I'm, I'm, I'm on the same page here. So are you saying that we do not want to restrict large vehicle access on the north end? Is that correct? I.e. to Ramblewood Drive. Well, I think, I think what I'm hearing, and you can sit for a minute, feel, <laughs> feel free to jump up if I misspeak, but what I'm hearing is that the larger units on the south will actually be on the outside of the gate. Okay. So users of those units will be coming and going 58. via 58 highway, okay. won't necessarily get back into the smaller units on the north. So I, I tend to think that's not really the big problem. The problem 
is, or the concern, let's say, is simply how big a, a truck or trailer can get into units on the north. And I, and I think we know that a fire truck can get in and out of there, so that's a fairly good size unit. If, if a customer were driving that, the chances of a customer driving a rig that big to a small storage unit, eh, it seems fairly remote. So, uh, we, so are we just going to leave as is, or are we going to add additional language? What, what is the proposal? Well, I'll just agreed with the applicant for for discussion. What I what I heard that seems like a reasonable middle ground to me would be uh, to grant exit only onto Ramblewood with a time limit programmed into the access control from say. 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or or whatever commission deems reasonable, which would which would stop traffic coming through there at night. And you know, I'm not stuck on 8 to 8. I could I could probably uh, I could probably see uh, slightly different hours because I'm not actually familiar with when the traffic is peaking to the storage units, but I, I think that seemed like a reasonable condition so that we didn't have a truck or a trailer wandering through Ramblewood in the middle of the night. I could see that being disturbing. Okay. Just a comment. So in the event that hypothetically it does happen, and we see a, additional traffic through there, we, the city does have the, uh, I won't say the power, but to restrict that coming back in either by requiring the applicant or the owner to put some type of, I don't know, some type of restriction, physical restriction there to disallow that. Okay, clarify for me, because I actually didn't follow okay. that. What's, so I think I understood you. What, that what, would you, what would you propose to allow on Ramblewood and what would you disallow? Be some type of height limit. Ah, height yeah. limit. Yeah, okay. so only you know, small vehicles. What I'm not sure about is obviously Ramblewood provides fire access both in and out. Okay. And that's and where I was going next. Okay. So if if we were to put a height restrictor on the Ramblewood exit, obviously fire department would have to be able to get around that. Okay. They'd already have to be able to get around that to go in okay. from Ramblewood. So I don't know that it seems particularly uh, challenging to allow them to open the to open the height restrictor so, so I'm tracking as now. well I'm tracking now okay yeah. All right. um, I, I think I'd like to get a I'd like to get a little more of a firm proposal on that on on the ramblewood exit before we bounce it off the applicant and say you know does this work for you can you live with this but that's that's where I'd be going, Commissioner Bowie. Um, Why well, didn't are you guys uh, overall okay? Uh, yeah. no, overall, um, I hate to be a, more of a I guess I'm more of a Debbie Downer on this uh, proposal than than everybody else. But um, yeah, I do trust the proposed findings of fact and uh, appreciate the work and research that the applicant's done. I'm still struggling uh, just with the overall con overall concept. Um, I, I think I'm the, if we look at the minute meetings, I was the person that talked about some of the industrial creep um, that, that it felt like. Um, it, it, to me, it feels like this is kind of an, an although it's zoned properly and the applicant is um, well within um, the standards that's been set with the proposal. It just feels like it feels like it's the wrong spot for this type of for this type mm -hmm. of building, um, and not that we're, we're just having discussion here. So not that we're necessarily voting on that per se, but no, I understand. it just it just feels like it's a, it's a very large it's a large footprint um, for uh, this particular building. And when I drive down, when I drove down from Lee Summit uh, today. I see storage facility on my left. I see storage facility on my right. And then we're talking about a quarter of a mile down the street having more storage to the right. And I'm, I'm, I'm traveling west mm -hmm. on 58. And it just seems like um, it's too much storage too close together. 
Um, and I, I think I brought up last meeting that uh, we're a city that's growing and I don't think we have anything in our code that limits the amount of storage facilities or uh, sets up some type of parameters, um, um, some space recommendations. Um, storage has to be within one mile of each other or can't be as close as whatever. But it just seems like it, it might be um, an eyesore, um, frankly. Um, and I just don't feel comfortable with saying hey, that's a good spot for storage. Although it's zoned properly, been zoned properly for years, I think we also need to consider what's happened in the area in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years. What it was zoned as in you know, 1985, 1973, maybe things look a little different now and we need to be considering that as opposed to just saying, oh, zoned uh, light industrial, hey, this light industrial building, stick it right here. Um, I just think we need to look, think a little deeper about that than just um, uh, going with that. So um, great research, you know, in terms of the information provided. Um, findings of fact, I don't see uh, an issue. Um, some, of the, some of the egress issues can be something we, we can talk about. I'm just not comfortable with um, big box storage. Well, <laughs> for, the, for the sake of discussion, first I'll, I'll reference back to Mr. Zur's comments a few minutes ago because I thought that was, I thought that was very well said. Uh, Mr. Zur did not use this term, uh, but it's kind of like that boat has sailed. So as, as far as, you know, we're looking at site plan. The, the zoning boat has sailed and <laughs> this is, is an allowed use of M1 zoning. So I think we would be in serious legal trouble to try to deny the applicant the use of the property for which it's properly zoned. Sure. Uh, I think I had one other comment, but oh, and, and I'll get off of this in, in one second, but what I felt like as, as I was listening to you, Commissioner Bowie, was a comment that I've made many, many times when a Walgreen moves in and a CVS moves in across the street or a McDonald's and a Burger King and a Taco Bell and a whatever or O'Reilly Auto Parts and I'm amazed that we don't have an auto zone and an advanced auto right across the street there on on the curve, but you know, clearly that happens in other locales. So, you know, I'm I'm definitely uh, a, a believer in letting the market drive the businesses. By the same token, growth management plan, planning and zoning commission have a purpose to regulate growth, and you know, I think in this case, um, I'll. I'll loop back and we'll get off of this, but we're, we're looking at an existing zoning and we're simply looking at a site plan for an appropriate use of that parcel. Mr. Zer, anything to add there or just shut up and get on with it? The way that you would control impacts on surrounding at this particular point would be your landscape plan and screening as well as the other items along the back walling of each one of these buildings that uh, provides um, opaque screening for the property. Thank you. Well said. Chair? Yes. Commissioner Sarsfield. Uh, as far as the egress, as far as uh, they mentioned heights on the gate and we can't have that because of the emergency vehicles that have to go in and out of the complex. Uh, if you have two keypads at the Ramblewood Drive on the inside, it would be for anyone inside to get out. Mm -hmm. The keypad on the outside would be with the sign, of course, posting beside it saying emergency entrance only for appropriate vehicles, emergency vehicles, whatever, exit only. So the first person who comes up by accident and he hits the keypad with his four digit code number that works at the front gate, so to speak, and it does not work in the side gate, 
because it isn't programmed for that. It's only programmed for emergency vehicles. So that will stop anyone from coming into the Bramblewood entrance or that gate as an entrance. They can only leave it as an exit. So the people that are leaving there is just strictly leaving. But the fire, ambulance, so forth, with the right keypad coded and so forth, which is very easy nowadays, you can put the uh, keypad there so the emergency people can get in and out regardless. Yeah. Seems reasonable to seems reasonable to me. Yeah. I would uh, I would if I could yes, sir, turn I'd, I'd ask the applicant if that's something that you'd be amenable to. Yeah. To be clear, I guess <clears throat> what am I what is the question, I guess, to make sure? Well, I, what, what Mr. Sarsfeld said there with regard to the signage that would prohibit entrance at that point, but allow for exiting from that particular spot as it is, we know most of the larger vehicles are gonna be on the south end and enter and exit from the south end off of 58 Highway. Right. Uh, the Ramblewood would be for those customers who probably have smaller rental units and might access them from time to time and want to exit there if there's congestion at the front entrance. And, to, and I think that that's why you wanted it there, if I'm not mistaken. Right, and so, so I think the, for clarity's sake, yeah, we, we can put signage on that Ramblewood side of that gate that would say exit only. There wouldn't be a keypad on the Ramblewood side, though, on, on the Ramblewood portion. The only keypad would be inside the facility. On the Ramblewood side, for emergency access or whatever else it'll be, there's processes through which there'll be a knocks box that either they can fire truck and hit out and hit the button or do whatever it be, but there won't be a keypad on the Ramblewood side that yeah. someone, like I say, if they showed up, they wouldn't have any ability to type it in, but we could put a sign up on that gate for certain that would say exit only. So like I said, if someone made the mistake one time and looked down there and made the mistake. Yeah. So that was your original design to begin with, that we're just mentioning now sure. potential signage. So people yeah. don't attempt to enter. Yeah, so yeah, point. so if that's it, yeah, if that's the direction, yeah, we're completely fine with that of putting signage or whatever it be, but just to be clear, there won't be a keypad that they could even touch right. on the Ramblewood side, it'd all be internal only. So yeah, we're completely fine with whatever yep. signage or we would need to do on that side. But okay. there is a way for them to get in that side entrance. Yeah, fire would have the ability to get in. How would it, they do it if there's no keypad is what I'm asking. That's what I say, so from fire's perspective, I'd have to go back and look we'll at that exact the gate, but I mean, my opinion is that there's about. either yeah, that there's a the knox box is the is the universal uh, way that fire departments get into just about any facility that is a public facility schools mm. churches okay any, i mean the, that type of facility oh, okay. it's a it's a right. it's a universal way for them to have emergency right. entrance. Right. The, the exact details of it i can't give you but my belief and yeah. memory of seeing these before is it seems like say the knox box would be outside they could get a key they could insert a key in that gate and for them only that key that that would open that gate yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's fine. The mayor answered my question for me. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> Commissioners, any other questions before we let Mr. Slush sit down again? <laughs> I always feel guilty if you can tell. <laughs> uh, he can comment, but not question. Okay. Well, uh, take you your chance. You can sit down if you'd like. Um, Commissioner Fizer. I, uh, I just want to say I think you've actually made pretty good use of this site because it's a really kind of oddly shaped site. Yeah. And I think as far as the effect on 58, it's pretty minimal considering how big it is. It's kind of the, the, the frontage of it is, is pretty, pretty minor. So I don't think it's really gonna, you know, impede the beauty of 58 Highway, especially in that area anyway. But, and I also think that the way you've sided the building so that the back sides are against the residential areas so that it's not like they're gonna look out their backyard and see people unloading things. They're just gonna see a wall and hopefully, you know, a nice screen of trees. So I think actually you've been pretty sensitive to the neighbors. Um, you know, I don't, I personally don't have a problem with it. I think, you know, it's been obviously zoned for light industrial. So, you know, it's, it seems like a pretty unobtrusive kind of business to put there versus, you know, something else that could be so. I'm just kind of saying that's a good point, so mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate that. Um, Are you just, ready to move forward? <laughs> I, I think so, the, the key 
the key squishy thing is how we word the uh, ramble wood. Yeah, let, I, I'll take a shot at it. Good. Okay, because there's some discussion I want to have afterwards anyway. Oh, sure. Uh, so I would um, make the motion that we accept the staff's uh, recommendations and their findings of fact uh, to accept um, case number 17024, G and G self storage site plan, and uh, subject to the conditions as stated by staff. In addition, uh, the request as explained by the applicant for the Ramblewood exit. Would you like to add any time limit on the Ramblewood exit or, or anything additional or are you simply making a motion to allow the applicant to use Ramblewood as an exit? Yeah, I'm gonna leave the motion of that and if there's, a, if okay. there's one that wants to come up later to amend that, we'll talk about it, but I wanted the motion on four so I could discuss it. No. Second. All right. So more or less, motion by Mayor Turnbow, second by Commissioner Crane oh. to accept staff recommendations and proposed findings of fact on case 17024 uh, subject to staff's noted conditions with the addition of allowing the applicant to use an exit onto Ramblewood. Yeah. Very good. No, that's, that's that about it. Yep. Okay. And uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Yeah, I, 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 I think <laughs> uh, I would like to have some discussion if I could, please. Uh, you know, the, would, uh, yes, yes, sir, Mr. Sir. Was there a second? Yes, yes Mr. Crane. Crane. I, no, that's a good question. No. Better now than later. Okay. <laughs> The, the, you know what, uh, I, I hear your concern, Mr. Bowie, about, the, about how our community has grown. That is absolutely why we need another facility like this. The others are already overflowing. There's waiting lists. I do know that Mr. Glywell has a waiting list now for that front portion if it were to go through. I've talked to staff about this with the industrial zoning uh, that was already in place and the buffering that will actually be provided uh, between the multifamilies along Crest Drive and what the plans that we're gonna be looking at later at, it's gonna provide, I think, a great buffering capability with a tremendous asset to our community for temporary storage with all the movement of people that we have coming in and out of our community. If you can't drive through a neighborhood, you can't find a home that's not for sale. And it, there, there is a, a lot of folks that are moving into our area and need temporary storage uh, just exactly what Mr. Glidewell has proposed to us tonight. And I, as a police chief, have looked at, if you'll look at the, uh, the properties that sit there now and the one overhead on the overall map that they provided, you see that there, I've had all kinds of problems as police chief with that pad that sits there right now, that concrete. I just as soon have that eliminated and something secure like this be in place for the security of that particular area. And that's just from coming from my opinion on the particular project. I think it's a great use of that, that uh, slim, long, slim piece of property. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why I'm going to vote in favor of it tonight. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mayor Turnbow. Uh, Commissioner Crane. I'll make it short. I agree 100% with the mayor. Uh, I generally agree. I'm still a little bit concerned about traffic on the Ramblewood exit 24-7. I, you know, my crystal ball is not really showing me the future, so I don't know, but if I, but if I lived in Ramblewood and I had probably any degree of traffic coming through there obviously the people that live in in the ramblewood neighborhood have gotten used to no traffic coming through they've gotten a little spoiled um, but i'm i'm still a little leery of allowing that exit to operate 24 7. is there a particular hour of operation that the applicant might have just suggested no uh, mr slash 
I'll let you hang yourself with your own rope. I, th I think I heard eight to eight, but I'm not I'm not hung up on that. What? Right, and and I think that eight or nine o'clock at night, whatever you guys feel comfortable with, would be more than adequate. And eight or nine o'clock in the morning would be more than adequate, mm -hmm. because like I say, the weekend, you know, during the middle of the day, you're going to have most of your activity, right. and then on the weekdays, most of your activity is going to be after work, typically, or you know, a few during the day, but that that period. So if if we did eight 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 o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, mm -hmm. those are perfect times. So I said eight to eight originally, that's fine. If you're willing to go eight to nine to give a little flexibility, I'm fine, but we're right in that range. And, I, and I'm trusting your combined experience with customers and, and you know, don't really want to inconvenience the customers nor the residents of Ramblewood. Right, yeah, I mean, like I said, that's the whole intent. We, we don't intend to do something that's gonna drive traffic through them at right. any extra hour other than normal daytime okay, stuff. thank you. So I could make a motion to amend, we could see how the commission feels, or if I don't have support on limiting the hours, uh, we can go with the motion as, as it is on the floor. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to go ahead and amend my motion, that way you don't have to vote on an amendment. Uh, so I would amend my motion then to include a restrictive hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. for use of exit at the Ramblewood exit. And the second. rest of my motion would remain. Mm -hmm. Mr. Crane is seconded. Yeah. So we're legal as long as the same two. And, and I take it that is acceptable to, uh, to the applicant. We're, we're, trying, we're trying to strike a balance here with surrounding uses and I appreciate your cooperation. Um, Okay, so the motion on the floor, and, and I'm gonna try to summarize, but basically was to accept staff uh, recommendation, proposed findings of fact, uh, subject to the conditions noted by staff with the addition of allowing exit onto Ramblewood during the hours of 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. That sound about right? Okay. And has been agreed by the applicant. And right, applicant is, is agreeable to that as well. Is there any further discussion from the commission? And if not, let's take a vote on the motion. I won't restate it again. It's kind of a tongue tangler. So all those in favor of the motion uh, as it stands, raise a hand, please. Six, seven, I've got seven in favor, uh, all opposed, and Commissioner Bowie in opposition, and I think that leaves me in abstention. Who is it? Ah, and Commissioner Anderson abstaining. So I've got seven in favor, one opposed, one Abstention, Commissioner Boy, would you like to add anything to your vote in opposition? No. Okay. And uh, I don't know what we do with abstentions. Do we? Do do we uh, add comments, Commissioner Anderson? Of course. Uh, yes, I abstain in listening to wise counsel from uh, Mr. Zer and listening to the comments from. Uh, fellow commissioners and Mr. Mayor as well. Um, I understand as a commission we're only discussing and voting on the site plan, but uh, my mindset is, you know, before I can improve or deny anything, I put myself as if I was a business that was close to this property or if I was a resident that was close to this property. And in this case, mostly the, the residents, I don't think this is probably a good, specifically some of the buffering that was done. I think the the Board of Adjustments decreased for 20 feet to 10 feet. You know, that is an impact to me if I was a resident there, specifically on Crest there, and then the discussion on the Ramblewood as well. So uh, this is a concern from that standpoint. So I will stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate your comments. All right, well, thank you. That concludes case 17024 and uh, takes us on to 17015.
rezoning the Heritage Hills lots 158 through 175 from R1 to R2. And this case will require a public hearing. I kind of say that as a reminder. Yeah. I'm trying to figure this out. I thought it was further back here. Gosh. And Mr. Grass is. Is this yours or Mr. Cataret's? Uh, I will be handing this one tonight, sir. Uh, okay. Um, if you would, Mr. Grass, uh, we will start with staff report on case 17015. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, so the applicant, Sean Siebert, represent, representing uh, CT Midland LLC, is coming back before the commission tonight. Uh, if you remember back to a meeting on May 16th of 2017, mm -hmm. Um, this applicant was present at that meeting as well and uh, submitted the same request for the rezoning of the property here uh, in question this evening. Um, at that meeting, uh, due to the lack of a master plan for the, for the subject property as well as the property that's owned adjacent to this property by the same applicant, um, due to the lack of a master plan for that area, uh, the commission uh, forwarded this case to City Council with a recommendation of denial. Um, however, after that meeting, the application made the decision to place that application on hold um, while they went back to the drawing boards and came up with uh, a more concrete master plan or a conceptual plan, if you will, um, for, the, for not only this subject property, but for the two properties that are also owned by that applicant that surround this subject property as well. Um, so they're here this evening to, to present that to you tonight. I will note that, that because that was forwarded with a recommendation of denial and was put on hold, um, this case still has yet to make it in front of city council. Um, so this is just you know an update on where we were before and where we're at now. Um, so I'll go through the staff report here and provide you some information um, the applicant has placed in front of you, um, a packet of information that displays some renderings and some aerial views of what their development would look like in the future, um, you know, should they, should they be able to move forward with this development and the rezoning this evening. Mm -hmm. um, so as I mentioned, Sean Siebert representing CT Midland is requesting the rezoning of Heritage Hills lots 158 through 175 from R1 single family district to the R2 single and two family residential district. Um, and I've included an area or an aerial photograph that delineates the location of the property um, in relation to the surrounding properties, as well as some property pho photographs that show uh, kind of what the property look like, looks like today. So you can see the first photograph shows the property, uh, the view looking north along Washington Street, and which currently dead ends at the southern uh, property line of the applicant's property. Um, the next photograph on page three is going to show the view from Samantha Street in the Ramblewood subdivision. Um, looking north, which shows sort of a natural buffer that exists along that southern property line. Um, and the next picture is going to show a view looking east along the southern boundary, which also shows another existing kind of natural buffer um, that exists from some trees and some shrubs that will remain on the property as well. Um, the next picture shows a view looking south from Pine Street, which shows the future connection of Washington Street um, from Ramblewood up to the Heritage Hills subdivision. Um, and then the last subject or last photograph is going to show your view looking east along Pine Street. Uh, that road currently dead end, sort of in the middle of this property, but it will be extended um, to the very eastern property line um, as this property continues to develop. As I mentioned, the property is currently zoned as the R1 single family residential district. Um, it is surrounded by R2 uh, single and two family residential district to the north, uh, R3A multiple family residential district, and PUD zoning to the south. Uh, R1 single family to the east, and C2 uh, commercial development to the west. Um, and I've included a zoning map that illustrates those locations as well. Uh, the future land use map identifies this area as appropriate for uh, low density residential use, uh, and the major thoroughfare plan uh, classifies mm -hmm. Pine Street as a, major, as a minor collector, and Washington Street from Pine Street south to 58 is classified as a minor collector as well. Um, because this is a public hearing, the tonight's meeting was advertised in the July 27th edition of the Journal Newspaper um, for the public hearing this evening. Yeah. And the items of record included tonight are the uh, mailed notices to the adjoining property owners, the notice of publication in the journal, our unified development code, uh, the applicant's application, our growth and management plan, and the staff report itself. Um, and as I mentioned, the request is to reclassify about 6.79 acres of land legally known as uh, Heritage Hills lots 158 through 175 from R1 single family residential district to R2 single and two family residential district. Um, I've outlined the, the requirements the, the for a, re, or a uh, zoning map amendment below for your consideration. Uh, moving on to some previous actions on the property. Um, I'll skip ahead to some of the more recent ones here. Uh, back in 2009, the uh, Raymore or the point at Raymore townhomes, which are located directly south of this property, um, those were rezoned from R3B, apartment community residential district, to an R3A, multiple family residential district, which permitted the construction of single family attached dwelling units, which are currently under construction now, the townhomes. Um, 
back in uh, March of 20, th March 13th of 2017, Heritage Hills lots uh, 136 through 157, which is the property directly north of the subject property, um, those were rezoned from R1 single family residential district to R2 single and two family residential district to accommodate um, both single and two family dwellings. As I mentioned, that property is also owned by the applicant. Um, and as I mentioned before, on May 16th of this year, the applicant requested the rezoning of this very same property from R1 to R2, and the Planning Commission uh, recommended denial of that request um, for reasons that were described earlier. Um, previously, since this was just, you know, the application was placed on hold, we weren't required to hold another good neighbor meeting in, uh, in addition to the one we held previously, uh, but the comments that were made at that previous meeting are included for your review as well. Um, as I mentioned, the purpose of the R2 single and two-family residential district is meant to accommodate uh, a mix of both single and multi single and two-family residences, so uh, single-family homes and duplex units. Um, and staff has included the use standards as well as the development standards for both of those districts for your viewing. Um, there are no minimum minimum home size requirements defined in our unified development code. However, subdivision covenants, um, which sit in front of you there tonight, um, could, if, they, if the applicant so chooses, define a minimum, hose, minimum um, home size requirement. Uh, the, de the developer intends to use the existing plat of Heritage Hills 158 through 175 um, that was accepted back in 1985, and those lots do um, comply with the minimum development standards of the R2 and R1 uh, zoning district. Um, there are no screening requirements under the current R1 or proposed R2 zoning district for the subject property. Um, future development to the land to the west that is zone C2 will require us to establish a type A screen um, when that development occurs that would separate those two commercial uses from the residential use. Um, and as I mentioned, natural, a natural uh, screening buffer currently exists along the southern boundary and various portions of the other, uh, the other boundaries of the site as well. Um, and development on the subject property will require a connection of Washington Street, south of Pine Street, um, and Samantha Street. So making that connection through the subdivision. Um, at the time of their last request, the commission um, you know, expressed concerns of the lack of a development plan and a, and a master plan moving forward for the properties owned by the applicant, and that's what they have submitted tonight, which is included under um, item number nine. It shows the uh, existing zoning of the properties that surround the subject property, um, and then the, the, pro the colors that are shown within that dashed line aren't necessarily the, the zoning of that property, but rather the land uses that will occur uh, within, the, within the applicant's master plan. So you've got a mix of two family uh, duplexes, single family, a little bit higher density multifamily units, um, as well as some open space mixed in to kind of buffer the uses that surround the area. Um, and as I mentioned, the applicant is currently pursuing the development of two or 22 two family dwelling units um, on the lots that exist to the north. Um, and then there's a new, uh, the engineering division did, has reviewed this application and uh, indicated that adequate services do exist to serve the proposed development and there are specific comments uh, located in the memorandum uh, at the very back of the staff report. Uh, to moving on to the staff recommendation, staff does support the uh, request for reclassification of zoning. Um, it is our, our opinion that the, the applicant has done their homework as far as coming back with the master plan as, as far as what they intend to do um, with the overall concept of this development. Um, so the staff would recommend the rezoning of this request. Um, and I've submitted a map that would show the, the development plan for the property moving forward and the applicant uh, is prepared to kind of walk you guys through kind of what that development might look like moving forward. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them for you. Um, if not, I think the, uh, the applicant is ready to, to walk you through that process. I'm good with that. Thank you, Mr. Grass. Uh, any questions of staff at this time? Otherwise, let's go ahead to the applicant. And if you would, just give us your name. My Take name is Sean Siebert with CT Midland. Right, thank you. Again, as David said, we're here tonight to ask for uh, rezoning of Heritage Hills, lots 158 through 175. Okay, so can, I I, can I ask you to hold for just a second, Commissioner Anderson? Do you have to do public comment first? Oh, no, staff, uh, applicant first, public. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, go ahead, Mr. Zer. I just want to make sure opening of the public hearing for this matter. Yeah, we can open the public hearing on case 17015. I uh, think normally I don't do that until after the after applicant, but that's fine. <laughs> I don't really imagine there's a whole lot of public here to comment. It looks like you've got your team. <laughs> I think I got my request in. So. Tonight I provided two packets. One, this one with the bind on the long side is the HOA. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna talk much about that. 
Right. <laughs> if you guys like to thumb through it and if you have any questions, Rod Hoffman, he put the HOA together. He'll answer any questions you have. City staff has looked at the HOA and their comments on it. It's very restrictive. So. <laughs> Um, I think that we, was our initial. We, that was our initial take too. Yeah, we own we, just we own a lot of property evening. in Kansas City, uh, right here in Raymore, Belton, mm -hmm. Grandview, Independence. Been in the property management business for since for 35 years. So, uh, things that we see um, that we've done in the past, we'd like to do better this time. You know, a lot of a lot of things that are a lot of things we see are the small things like the trash cans that sit outside and. Mm -hmm you know, vacant vehicles and that sort of thing. So it's all included in here. If any questions, again, Rod Hoffman will okay. take the lead on that. I hope, I tried to get these here early tonight so you guys could maybe glance at them so I don't have to go through every single page. So if you guys would flip to uh, page one, this is the uh, basically the master plan of Heritage Hills. Um, there was a resident here at the last meeting. He had asked for some additional screening. So we uh, put some berms below on the, I guess this is North Franklin that comes up. So we have berms on the uh, east and west of that. Um, the detention basin back there, we have a sidewalk with two entrances and a sidewalk will go around that detention basin. Um, other than that, as far as screening and land layout, that's about what I have to say there. If you'd flip to the next page, I can start to talk about the various phases. Sure, please do. So this next page shows the different phases. So phase one is in the red, phase two in the green, and phase three in the blue. Phase one is the piece of property that in March got rezoned to R2 and our intention is to build duplexes there. Mm -hmm. Phase two is a subject property to for tonight, our intention is to build duplexes there as well. Phase three in the back comprises 23 single family houses, 20 duplexes, and eight fourplexes. And the intention of those fourplexes is to be an assisted living facility. Hmm. So in the center, that's kind of what anchors our community. But when we bought the land, we came in, we met with city staff, and we kind of told them what we wanted to do here. We wanted to have a mix. We wanted to have something for everybody. We wanted to have single family houses, two family houses, and we wanted to have a, I guess you'd say elderly care facility. All of our properties are gonna be slab on grade. There will be no steps. Um, all of our properties, with the exception of the assisted living, are two bedrooms. We will not have any three bedrooms. We've been doing this long enough to know that if you have three bedroom units, it draws a different kind of crowd. The crowd we're catering towards is elderly people, divorcees, young professionals. So that's the crowd we're going after. We're not restricting who we're leasing it to by any means. We're just building the property for the people we'd like to lease out to. As far as the buildings themselves, um, I'm probably not going to get into the center section, the renderings too much. If you guys want to glance at those, these are just rendering views of, of the building. In the back half, you can kind of see the, I'll give you a page number here. How about page 31? These are the type of buildings that we're, we fully intend to build right here. Uh, four side stucco, we'll have stone and wood siding, um, accents to bring up the volume on the front. Uh, we'll have metal roofs on bu the bump out areas with a composite mix. The color scheme of the, of the entire subdivision will be uniform. So we don't intend to paint one brown and one pink. We're gonna paint them all this color that you're looking at right here. However, from building to building, they'll be different. So. We're not different in the color that we choose, but we're different in the elevations that we represent for building the building. So, as I said, as far as going in, once you're on the inside of the building, all the showers are zero entry. I'll give you the blueprint page. So, page 24. So, this is our. Uh, this is basically our duplex plan. Although that we see all those different eleva front elevations, the inside will be the same on each building as far as the duplexes go. Um, the showers are zero entry. You can wheel right in. They'll be curbless. Um, we'll have granite or quartz countertops throughout. Um, they're going to be finished out really nice on the inside. 
and I apologize if I missed this. I'm probably remembering from the earlier presentation, but I think your intent is that these will all be held in common ownership. These will not be sold to individuals. Is that correct? That is correct. And they'll all be maintenance provided units? Yes, sir. Okay. So Thank all you. maintenance provided. Apologies if you already said that. No, tonight, that's fine. I did not say that this evening. Okay. Other than that, I think that's about what I have to present on my master plan. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments and answering any questions you guys have. Thank you. Now, I will say, uh, I'm, you know, we, we didn't see these until tonight. I'm quite impressed. The, uh, the architecture, the, the artwork here, and, you know, I'm kind of a visual person. Picture's worth a thousand words, and frankly, this is quite impressive. There's a lot of work that went into this. <laughs> I do need to go on the record on one thing. Uh -huh. Go ahead, please. So on some of the renderings, if you will, that shows a front porch, uh -huh. we've decided as of late last week that we're going to take and eliminate the front porch and move it to the back. Um, mm, okay. So pages, the CAD files that come out today, which is pages 25, 6, 7, mm -hmm. 8, nine those show updated front elevations uh -huh. on what those are going to look like without that front porch right. we just figure with this many tenants you know this guy's got a this color on umbrella this guy's got this <laughs> patio set you know we'll put all that in the back keep that out of sight out of mind okay so, so thank you question appreciate it thank you right here question sorry, sorry. <laughs> commissioner Bowie. um you said slabs right yes sir no basements we'll have six basements on I'll look up the lot numbers so everyone's on the same page. First phase, got bad eyes, 141, 140, 139, 138, 137, and 136, which is basically the most north buildings. Just the lay of the land, we have to dig basements, and they're going to be daylight basements. Mm -hmm. Current intention is not to finish those basements. Okay. Just leave them open for storage, and we probably will charge a little bit higher rent on those units. Right, so you'll have uh, basements going or steps going down to those. For those that have basements, you got to get down there. Um, the renderings look real spacious. Are you guys planning to do something in terms of setbacks and all that? Are you planning to do something a little? Uh, they just look very spacious in terms of the renderings, the, the the surrounding area around each particular building. So, and that's kind of when when you go to the renderings of phase one and two, you're like, man, this is nice. This is really spacious. And then you get back and look yeah. at the renderings of phase three, and you're like, oh, this kind of seems crammed in here, yeah. in my opinion. Just the, the situation is, is phase one and phase two were platted back in 1987. So we're working with those existing plats. So yeah. we plan to leave it exactly as it is. It's going to, the front two are going to be more spacious just because we're working with an already okay. existing cool. plat. Thanks. Mr. Chair. Any yeah. question? Uh, Mayor Turnbow. I had a question. I, I, I thank you for doing this. I, I love the, the growth plan that you put together here. I mean, we probably would have been a, a little nicer to you had we had that originally. Um, so I, I do appreciate you doing this. It is a, a, a lot of work that, as our chairman said. the uh, I noticed you have an open space. Have you all considered uh, like what Morning View has, like a clubhouse and some other amenities that that might go along with a with an HOA as far as, because you have a lot of, uh, you're going to have a lot of residences in there. I assume that's one big neighborhood project. Um, have, have you not thought about doing anything like that? I don't know that we'll go as far as to do a, a clubhouse per se, but I know that uh, various different trails and I know that we're going to have a park. Um, in the center of the living facility, senior living facility, we'll have a decent sized park, which it should be shown in there. I was just looking at it's the It's not overhead. on my renderings, but okay. it's on page one. If you look on page one, and then we're gonna try, try to incorporate as many trails as we can around each of the detention basins. As far as a clubhouse goes, we, that hasn't been a plan yet. Okay. Um, just curious. Thank you. Page 35 at the, in the back, the inspiration image. Uh, where is that going to be? In which phase on the map? Or is this? So this image is the image I based the architecture off of. I based the outside colors off of. 
oh, okay. the roof lines. So it, in essence, it's only an inspiration image. It's to show you something that's really built out with those colors and those type of roof lines and what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. It is more of a modern look, but it's not a modern look in your face of this is modern. I, I think it has a lot of traditional elements to it uh, with the stone and, and the way the colors are done. So this is just kind of a takeaway for what we hope to look like in the end. Right, and it's labeled inspiration image, which yeah. is to clarify. I might add, I heard earlier about, Mayor made a comment about demand. And right. I have a 10, 10 person waiting list right now for properties at Raymore. Uh, I have a very high demand for a two bedroom and something that's a little bit higher end. So just to add a little bit more, um, there's demand there for this right. product in this town. I don't have it in Independence. I don't have it in Grandview. Mm. I don't have it. I do have a little bit in Lee Summit, but I don't have a waiting list like I have in Raymore. Why that is, I don't know. So <laughs> Would, that's, that's the reason behind the project. Right. Sure. Right. Thank you. But, uh, Commissioner Bowie? Yeah, just curious, curiosity. Uh, are these per these are purchasable, right? And what so what 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 are we talking about in terms of price or? No, I think these I are think not these are not per okay. These, these are, are going to be managed. Intended, okay. These are intended to be held in common ownership gotcha. and, and I assume rented or leased. But Le okay, yeah, great. Yes. Just making sure. Thanks. Right. Um, I'm a little out of sequence uh, here. I I want to allow anyone from the public to come and speak on this case um, while the podium is open and <laughs> yeah thank you if, if anyone from the public would like to speak on case 17015 Heritage Hills lots 158 through 175 rezoning from R1 to R2 please come forward and seeing no one I'm just dying to whack the gavel once and I'm gonna close the public hearing, dispense with that. Commissioner Anderson, we're back to discussion. Absolutely, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I want to, for the record, you know, commend the applicant for uh, the information provided in the master plan. Uh, originally, I had a concern with the zone creep. If you heard some of the discussion from the previous uh, item on the agenda here, I had concerns in terms of if I lived there or I lived adjacent to the property, uh, I will say that I would be proud if I did live next to this here. Uh, and it is coming together. We were kind of joking around with the, uh, I guess the, the HOA rules, <laughs> and it makes sense now in terms of what you're doing and why you're doing it. So I commend you guys on both fronts. So um, um, I'm very happy with this and I'm very happy with the uh, long-term plan and I think you guys did a uh, looking at page 10 in our, our, our docket here is uh, the open space that butts up against the property that we have talked about as well uh, so uh, that makes a lot of sense as well so thank you very much for putting a lot of thought into this mr. Zer I just I just want to make sure that I have your attention and and uh, you have me on a short leash here so one of one of the things since we've since we've essentially heard this case before not not with all of the detail on the surrounding area though and, and i might add that makes a big difference um, one of one of the things that i think i found quite difficult about this case and i would like this to show in the uh, in the record if I can just find it again but the previous history of this property as summarized very nicely by staff was that that uh, and this was previous planning actions on or near the property on page six and seven of the staff report so what what I think made this case more difficult than usual was the fact that um, the plat was approved in 87 the 1979 zoning map designated it as r3 it it basically it flipped and flopped and and got 
caught up uh, on uh, a default uh, step four, I guess, basically, because we could not locate any legal ordinance establishing R3 zoning. It ended up being reverted back to R1 in 2004, which basically uh, is just simply explanation of what prompted the need for the case and the rezoning request from R1 to R2. So it's, it's, it's definitely got a lot more history than a lot of properties. The sticking point the last time we heard it was that we were looking at it in isolation and I think that when the property to the north was rezoned we had gotten the impression that this was going to be R1 and so what what concerned us also was the fact that earlier this year we had been told it would would be R1 and then it was requested to rezone to R2 looking at it in in total uh, I think you know if we were starting with this property from a clean slate it it would have had a uh, a development agreement in today's time it would have had a development agreement and an overall preliminary plat which is essentially what we're seeing here and and it certainly works a lot better for me now mr. Zer, here's my concern the case this evening only pertains to the tract uh, I would I would call it the uh, southwest tract of this overall property lots 158 through 175 <clears throat> and I don't really feel like this is a sticking point but clearly we're being requested to approve rezoning of that individual tract on the assumption that the applicant will proceed with the development plan for the property to the east. We really don't have any legal teeth on that to, to assure that, that the property to the east develops as shown with, with the open space, et cetera. Am I correct? That is a fair assessment with regard to your proposal this evening. They are not bringing forward their proposed master plan for approval. The concept, and I was discussing this real quickly with Mr. Grace regarding uh, master plan approval. It's my understanding they will be coming back to you all for approval of the master plan for PUD designation on the entirety of the proposed development. I would also note from you for a from a procedural standpoint, you all did have the opportunity to consider this application back in May of 2017. It was reviewed at that time and uh, forwarded with a recommendation of denial mm -hmm. before it reached the city council level. However, the applicant held on to it and uh, um, requested the item be placed on a hold for reconsideration um, based upon an evaluation of the full master development that you have before you this evening. Um, based upon the prior recommendation, my thought for you this evening is it has the same case number as the former case, or I'm sorry, as the former consideration in May, and therefore if you're going to take action this evening, and I will simply say if you are going to take action to approve it this evening, the notion would be we will uh, considering the new information provided at this evening's public hearing, um, approve the, I'm sorry, amend the recommendation from denial to approval and forward the case uh, to the city council for further consideration. I just want to make sure we're, we're not identifying this as a new case. It's right. the original case. So I'm proposing a challenge for you all in how you're crafting your motions, but I want to make sure and get that out there for you to start thinking about at this point. No, I, I appreciate your farsightedness. And uh, I, I, as, as I said a minute ago, this, this is a bit of an unusual case because the property was platted so long ago and not master planned or, or development agreement as we would have today. So it's, it's a little unusual. Uh, frankly, I think the, uh, I, I'd like to get the title right on the, on the uh, Heritage Hills Master Plan Phases 1, 2, and 3. I think, I think this document does address 
a lot of the concerns that I saw rereading the minutes from our May 16th meeting. So other commissioners, comments? Uh, sure. Commissioner Anderson. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion, or excuse me, I will make an amended motion to the um, case 17015, uh, which was rejected 7-1, amend the motion to approval of case 17015, request to reclassify zoning of 6.79 acres of land legal described as Heritage Hills, lots 158 through 175 from R1, single family residential district to R2, single and two family residential district and four to city council with the recommendation of approval. Second. Okay. Who did the second? Commissioner Sarsfield. Yeah, uh, Curly here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Anderson. So uh, this is going to be tough to rephrase a uh, motion by Commissioner Anderson, second by Commissioner Sarsfield to amend Planning and Zoning Commission's May 16th. May 16th, 2017, uh, recommendation of denial and recommend approval of case 17015 mm -hmm. to city council based on staff proposed findings of fact. Mm. Not great, but close enough. All right. Mm. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Mr. Chair. Thank Mayor Turnbull. I would ask, Mr. Zur, is there a way to enter this into the official record if it's not already with regard to uh, this motion that it be part of the decision process for this group? Or does that make it too sticky? I, it's a good, great question because we have had a lot of discussion regarding the overall master plan. I don't believe we can tie any land use or any um, thing that's included in that document on the other portions of the property because that's not part of our hearing tonight. That's not part of what we're doing tonight. What we can indicate though, um, in discussions with the applicant is any proposal moving forward on the back acreage, in staff's mind to obtain staff support, it's gonna need to be what they conceptually presented to you this evening. Mm -hmm. They will come forward with a preliminary plat uh, through the normal process we would see for vacant land. So we will see this master plan again. If it varies to any degree from this plan, that, that it's not gonna gather support, nor would I imagine it would gather support from the planning commission mm -hmm. moving forward. I think the tone has been set for how you expect that rear acreage to develop according to this plan. That's so, how I'm taking this evening's okay. discussion. So what's you. shown as phase three is currently unplatted. Unplatted, and it's currently zoned agricultural, so it oh. will have to go forward through a rezoning, it will have to go forward through a preliminary plat. So we will see this conceptual plan again as it, right. this project moves forward. I just don't think we could tie that together this evening. I just, I want to let them know again, I appreciate the good faith effort you did and all the work right. that, that you put into this. Awesome, and you're, and you're right. We need that kind of housing in our area. Mr. Zur, anything further to add on there? Or do you, do you concur that we can't enter the master plan into the record? I, I think that is a fair assessment, which goes back to your original comments of, uh, uh, yes, that is being submitted to us for a review and representation of what's going to be provided by the applicant here this evening, um, but does not really have the legal teeth that we would be able to enforce anything with it other than future applications that come before this commission and the council. Let, let me get a little sticky here for a minute. So one of the things that we see fairly often with a site plan is, for instance, signage. Knowing that the signage is not part of the site plan, signage is gonna come forward separately. So I'm wondering, you know, I think what I would like, unless you tell me it's not possible, what I would like would be for city council to have access to the Heritage Hills master plan phases one through three when the case gets to them. I, I, it seems reasonable to me and it, it doesn't seem, you know, I think we understand 
It's not legally binding, but when we review proposed signage as part of a site plan, it's not legally binding either. So I don't really see that it's a lot different. Go ahead. I would tend to agree. Um, so what you're talking about here, when we have our site plans come through and you're talking about signage, uh, if it's in a PUD, obviously, you're going to have greater degree of uh, control and discretion about that uh, for signage for all of the things that are applicable right. to the site development. In this particular case, you're just talking about three zoning. But I think that the comments you have been making the commission has been making and members of the commission have been making this evening um, will be reflective in the minutes that are being provided and would justify right. inclusion of the exhibits that are being submitted this evening. Uh, I understood those exhibits to be provided by the applicant and uh, as applicant designs, I anticipate those would be appropriate to forward along to the council. Good, and I see Mr. Cataret nodding in affirmation as well. So I think, I think that this does make a lot of difference uh, Okay, I'm good with that. Any further discussion uh, on the motion on the floor? And if not, all those in favor, this, this is a motion to recommend rezoning from R1 to R2 for Heritage Hills, lots 158 through 175, and recommend approval of that rezoning to City Council. All those in favor, raise a hand, please. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I got nine in favor, and therefore none opposed, no abstentions. Uh, thank you all very much. I know you put a lot of work into this. All right. That concludes old business. We have nothing this evening under new business. Uh, Mr. Zur, we would be delighted if you would present the City Council report to us. Thank you, Chairman, I'm happy to do so. We have had one meeting since your last uh, opportunity to meet, uh, August 8, 14th, so yesterday we had the opportunity to meet as a full council. At that time, there were a number of items that were taken into consideration. I'm not going to uh, dwell too long on it because I'm sure the mayor will want to make comment, but I would want to point out that our uh, chairman was recognized by the city council last night uh, under the Missouri Municipal League Civic Leadership Award, which was awarded at the council meeting. Um, it was a great award to be provided for the many years of service that he's provided to this uh, commission, uh, well-deserved and was recognized by each one of the council members. Uh, also would point out that uh, last night, and I won't go into great detail because I, again, I anticipate the mayor will make a comment on this one. They did set the 2017 tax levy for the city, uh, which drew some comments from members of the council as well as the mayor. Uh, they also approved for the Sorry. Uh, first reading, the 25th Amendment to the Unified Development Code. You all approved this uh, at a meeting on July 18, 2017 by unanimous vote. Uh, it has now had its first hearing and first reading uh, before the City Council. It was uh, approved unanimously as well, and there was a public hearing that was held on the matter for additional public input. Uh, the only other item I would note on here is the uh, Charter Review Commission has provided its report and the City Council will be, a, uh, has voted its initial vote and initial uh, determination for placing the Charter Commission Review's recommendations on the November 7, 2017 ballot. Those are the items of critical import and obviously I would invite uh, uh, other members of staff as well as the Mayor to provide additional input if he's inclined to do so. Thank you, Mr. Zerk. Uh, Mr. Cataret, Mr. Gress, uh, I think we're ready for uh, the staff report. For some reason, I'm looking forward to say planning pipeline, but I know you'll cover that. Yes, yes, I will cover that. Uh, thank you, sir. We did submit the uh, monthly report for the department for July. I would like to, to point out one item that it's really um, catching my attention. Um, it is the on the uh, page three of the staff report. When we talk about development activity, I give a I give a three year synopsis of of building permit activity, homes under construction. Certainly, it's a very active time for new home construction. You can see the number of 
active homes is 247. But what I wanted to just briefly point out is the uh, total number of undeveloped lots. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is a, it is a very interesting number when you really look at citywide. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, and I know you've heard me say this, that number was, we were well over 1,300 available lots in the city where you could walk in and simply secure a permit to build, meaning it, it was ready to be built upon. That number's dropped to 508, and, and, and that number does include, every time a new phase comes in in Creekmore or any other subdivision, it, it adds to that number, yet that is still decreasing that significantly. Uh, we're coming closer, I mean, it sounds like a lot of lots, but it's spread out the entire city. We're coming closer to um, the point where we're gonna, we're gonna, for development to continue to occur, we're gonna have to have new subdivision phases, new subdivisions come into the city. We're, we're almost to the point where all these available lots that went through foreclosure and bank, you know, bank, uh, 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 banks acquiring them, uh, those lots are gone now and the builders are building out those lots and, and so I think we are going to see an uptick in, in new subdivision development occurring as that number continues to decrease uh, because as we commented before, we, we're only at 50% build out in our city. We still have 50% undeveloped land area in the current city limits, so a lot of room for expansion. Um, kind of leads up to the uh, calendar coming up um, in one area, but first uh, do want to note that we have canceled the September 5th meeting of the commission. We did not have any items scheduled for the for that meeting. We talked about it a little bit at our last meeting. Uh, with September 4th being a holiday, the Labor Day holiday, City Council did have a need for a work session that week. And uh, so without any items on the commission agenda, uh, we somewhat forfeited that that evening so they could have a work session that evening. Um, but what we do have is a meeting scheduled for September 19th, so that'll be our next uh, gathering. Um, and so from my earlier discussion, one of the um, items on your agenda that's coming back is the Prairie View of the Good Ranch subdivision plat. This was a phase that was approved back in 2007. It's on the south side of of North Cass Parkway, south side of Hubach Hill Road, um, south of the Stonegate subdivision. And it got approval in 07, but because of the the housing, um, you know, the housing bust at that time, they just never constructed any, any infrastructure for that, for that phase. But with a shortage of lots, I think, you know, basically Stonegate is built out. They have a few lots left in Wood Creek. Uh, Good Otis LLC is wanting to start up this phase of the subdivision. Um, and what they're doing, it, it was approved at 60, 60 lots, I believe the replat, they're reconfiguring a couple of the really large lots um, and coming back with a replat at 65 lots. You may recall there was a proposal that came through from Salee Homes at one time, which was a much higher density. They, they had lots, I think of the 80s, a much, much smaller lots. That, but that proposal never, never went forward beyond, beyond the, uh, the commission here. And uh, so now what uh, Good Otis is doing is coming back <laughs> with the original proposal, basically lots that would be sized similar to Stonegate. It's really a, although it's got a different name, it's very similar to the Stonegate subdivision. So you'll be seeing that replat on the 19th, and then uh, City Manager Jim Fearborn will present the 2018-2022 uh, Capital Improvement Program, and it's a required public hearing uh, for the Planning Commission to hold prior to submittal of the of the uh, CIP to City Council for action. So that's currently what we have uh, on our calendar uh, for upcoming meetings. And with that, I'll conclude my part of the staff report. Mr. Crass, was there anything you wanted to cover from engineering? Well, I think uh, if the commission noticed, we completed recently the modifications to the traffic and parking around Municipal Circle. Also, uh, later, or actually tomorrow, we are holding a pre-construction meeting for the Raymore Activity Center. Looking forward to work starting on that shortly. I think those are the two biggest things we've got going right now. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Kress. I'll open the floor for public comment and seeing none, I'll open the floor for commission member comment. I'm tempted to try something different tonight and see if anyone would like to volunteer to be first commissioner to comment. Mayor Turnbow? I usually go last, so I'll go first. All right, that's great. <laughs> the, uh, what the 
Mr. Zur did talk about uh, at the council meeting, the tax levy, the budget was proposed, the tax levy uh, portion of it was proposed the other night, and it's actually gone down. Um, it will, from the, from the perspective of a landowner here, someone who owns a $200,000 home, they'll see a reduction in their uh, local taxes of uh, a little over $9. You know, it doesn't seem like much, but it's gone down, I mean, rather than up. And it, uh, that is due uh, in large part to the assessed valuation of our community going up. Uh, you know, just since our uh, tax levy issue uh, went through where our own uh, valuation has grown nearly 50 million in an assessed valuation. It's uh, pretty interesting to see our community grow uh, that much. It tells you the kind of, of uh, great reports that Mr. Cataret provides to us on a regular basis with all the new permits and, and growth that's going on in our community. We're real excited about that. And, and as he also said, uh, Chairman Faulkner was uh, recognized the, by the Westgate region of the Missouri Municipal League. It's a pretty big deal. The, uh, he couldn't make it to the, uh, to the actual uh, uh, presentation, which was uh, at the Missouri Municipal League's uh, banquet out at, uh, at Adams Point. And we missed you and we accepted it on your behalf, sir. Uh, but we great. really wish you could have been there so we could have shown you off to the other cities <laughs> as well. <laughs> and not just our own, because uh, we're really proud of you and the work that you've done and, and, uh, and appreciate all that you've done. And then uh, the last item, Mike, can you give them a quick update? I know I get asked a lot, maybe some of these folks do, about 155th Street and how we're progressing there with the bridge and the overlay? The, uh, the bridge is, over, is under design and we anticipate uh, advertising it for bid late this fall or early winter. Uh, the, some of the work that we're gonna be doing to 155th Street is currently out for bid. So we are gonna be looking at overlaying 155th Street from Kentucky to, to Madison yet this, yet this fall. Okay, thank you. Wow. And that's all I have, sir. Yeah, and thank you, Mayor Turnbow. I think I'll just keep going, uh, Commissioner Sarsfield. On the, uh, Mr. Stern, I think, or whoever can answer that, on the Unified Development Code, I think there were 25 items or something we talked about, and we agreed to 20 of them or so. There were 19 initially, we, you agreed to 17. Okay, uh, <laughs> whatever happened to the, unless I misunderstood, Mr. Stern, that everything was approved, does that mean all 19 were approved or the 17 were approved? Only 17 were presented to the council. So the other two will be coming back for discussion uh, in the future for the commission. All right, thank you. Yep. Uh, Secretary Crane. I am rubbing my hands together in anticipation of what I'm going to spend my $9 on. <laughs> All right. You can find me a milkshake afterwards. <laughs> Express. Vice Chair Pfizer, and thank you very much for covering last meeting oh, no in my problem. absence. I can't really follow the $9 comment, so uh, no <laughs> comment. All right, <laughs> Commissioner Anderson. I, I want to extend also uh, congratulations on, on your uh, recognition. Uh, uh, echo the mayor's comments, probably well deserved as well, so the check is in the mail. <laughs> right. Thank you. All right, congratulations. I'll, I'll, I'll mention something now rather than later. I, I will say that Mr. Zur was close enough. He probably should have kicked me in the ankle and gotten me to shut up. But, but uh, I did note that the work of the commission could not happen without all of the commissioners, the support of the mayor, the support of city staff, and I also looked around at city council and I'm trying to remember if there were only two or maybe three that had not been planning and zoning commissioners. So it's, it's certainly a team effort. I want that, I want that on record. It's, it's absolutely a team effort. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Armstrong. I would just to add my congratulations and um, just hope you all get a chance to enjoy the eclipse. Yeah, safely. Safely, of course. Uh, Commissioner Meiske. No comment. <laughs> okay, one shy. Commissioner Bowie. Um, congratulations, Commissioner Faulkner, on the award. Uh, well deserved. Um, Pre-con meeting, you said tomorrow. What time is a pre-con meeting? 
one o'clock in the afternoon up here? Uh, it will be in Center View. All right. Thank you. No, no further comment. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. Well, once again, thanks to city staff, Mr. Zur. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, and Mr. Crass, it, it's a pleasure to see you. We are sorry to have lost Mr. Eanes, but on the other hand, you're back. That's, that's uh, I guess we'll call that a mixed blessing. <laughs> Win some, lose some. Thank you for coming and thank you for your support. I would entertain a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Second. Okay, I heard Commissioner Anderson. Who did I get a second from? Everybody, Everybody. Commissioner Bowie. All right, second. all right. All those in favor of adjournment, raise a hand, please. I'm pretty sure that's nine in favor. Thank you. <laughs> None opposed, no abstentions.